Mr. Nick Roche, both have joined us today, which we are very, very excited about. And I've been told uh, to introduce them and then get out of their way, and they will talk a bit about <laughs> making comics. Enjoy! <laughs> I hope Simon comes back soon. <laughs> Okay, everyone, um, we're just going to, I mean, Nick and I have done this talk a few times, and one of our first things we always say is that we don't really do comics like this anymore, because this is now, we're going to take you through Spotlight Shockwave, which we did together over a decade ago, and, you know, Nick's processes have changed, various things have changed in this, but we'll take you through a, a kind of step-to-step -step of, of, you know, from script to art, and then we'll talk a bit about Spotlight Cup, which Nick did solo, and Spotlight Megatron. And then we'll round off with a little gallery I have of rare and unseen art from the end of Dreamwave, stuff that was never published, and the beginning of IDW. So uh, take you through from start to, you know, sort of to the end, really, of, uh, of Transformers at the moment. Um, I'm going to skip quickly through this because you all know that Marvel published the comic and then IDW published the comic and, and Infiltration was pretty much the start of the IDW Transformers first, their version of G1. And, you know, when, we, when Chris Ryle and I talked about doing New Generation 1 comics, we, we, we threw several ideas around, one of which was doing a kind of a crisis on infinite Cybertrons, whereby various continuities got mashed together into one new one. But we both decided that that required too much pre-knowledge on the part of new readers who maybe didn't know the various tangled other continuities of Transformers. So we settled instead on a, a fresh reboot, which was Infiltration, set in the present day with updates for a lot of the vehicle modes to put them into then contemporary versions of their classic characters. So everyone got a polish and, in, in, and it wasn't just physical as well. A lot of the personalities of the characters got a reboot as well. Still based on their classic G1 characters, but with a little, a few little twists thrown in, so they weren't exactly the same. Or we took a slightly different angle on them. I remember you saying at the time that your kind of mandate for yourself, your manifesto was, if it's been done before, don't do it again. And so you really took that. It's like, yeah, just because you think you know who Prowl is, that doesn't mean that he's not expendable now, or that we, we can do taking different directions. And, and and every other character you came in, and then. When I was doing some of the writing myself, that was what I took on board. That's why I kind of thought, yeah, well, I mean, if why reheat something that's been done quite well already, you know? Yeah, I mean, we didn't just want to do this, dish up the same thing in a, in a new package. So we really wanted the IDW first to sort of stand on its own. You know, so everything from the way they come to Earth, their mission on Earth, everything slightly was tweaked for this new uh, iteration of the G1 verse. Uh, but the, the problem we slightly had was we had a huge cast, we had a series of Asians, we had Stormbringer, but we had no real way of bringing other characters into the mix in any depth. So we started really on the idea of Transformers Spotlights, which as well as feeding into the main story would give us a chance to do little solo one-shots that folk were very character-centric. And, as I've just said, we didn't want the characters to be exactly the same. So, when I was pitching the ideas, all the ideas had to be put into a form of a brief story draft, and a little summary I did on each one of who the character is. So each uh, spotlight start the synopsis used to start off with a little, like, text spec of the, char of the character, so that IDW and Hasbro knew what tack I was taking with them. So with, with, with Shockwave, you know, we know he's this ultra-logical character, but I wanted to hint at this idea that there's another side to him that he has to keep tramping down all the time, that, you know, he's the creature of logic, but he could just as easily 
you know, be this creature of illogicality and, and rash action and emotion. But he keeps it very tramped down and, you know, under control for the most part. But in, in Spotlight Shockwave, we see him almost very logically decide to lose that aspect of himself and become a creature of anger and emotion. Like the, the most sensible option he has is to go nuts, isn't yeah. it? And that's, that's, that's the option he chooses, it's great, yeah. So, you know, there were just little tweaks to the characters each time. Um, and, you know, I was lucky enough with Spotlight Shockwave, uh, here's the issue here, to get Nick on art. And it was, was it your first pro work? It was my first, yeah, my first pro interior work. Um, I've been sort of working on like the fan scene and fanzines for a few years with the likes of James Roberts who writes Lost Light more than this and Jack Lawrence who is now drawing Lost Light. And we were all kind of part of like a UK, Transmasters UK fanzine club. And uh, so yeah, I've been sort of percolating under people's radar, trying to get work, trying to get work. I couldn't get work with Dreamwave because they had kind of a more um, strict sort of art style and I I, it's quite clear that I don't know how to draw like anyone else really, for good and for bad, so it's my stuff is kind of quite kind of bouncy and cartoony and energetic. And the thing is about IDW, they were really, they were like almost like a comic publisher first rather than a Transformers publisher, so they really saw the merit and benefit in uh, letting artists draw in styles that are comfortable to them, because if it's comfortable to them, that sort of enthusiasm will shine through, and I think that's what came across in my work for IDW. So I've been doing some, the first job I had at IDW was drawing uh, Chris Ryle as a Transformer. Chris Ryle was the editor-in-chief, and he said, hey Nick, do you want to draw me as a Transformer? I'm like, I want to work for Transformers, so yes. <laughs> so uh, if the editor-in-chief of a company asks you to draw a vanity project for him, you say yes. And so he eventually started getting me to do covers for the Infiltration series, and um, then Beast Wars, and then uh, I knew I was kind of like, was ready for it to be picked to do some interior work soon. Um, but it's funny, I, so I got to work with Simon, who at the time I was a proper, I, I still am, but I was very much a proper, proper fan of Simon, was the guy who wrote all the Transformer comics that had mattered to me. And so it was, um, it genuinely was a case for me that I was starting at the top, I was starting with the writer I wanted to work with on the title I wanted to work for, and uh, it's kind of been downhill ever since, really. But, <laughs> but it's one of the things where, excuse me, we both, seem to recognize that we there was a kind of nice alchemical reaction on this not not that we're oh what was you know hey we were good that day but you know but, but we were we both seem to be on top of our a games like the it's a really really strong story a really great done in one i'm I'm still unusually happy with the artwork considering it's like you know 10 year 11 years ago since since we did it and josh josh Burton's colors kind of came out beautifully so it's a really nice and it's it's good because it was intended to be this cornerstone of the IDW universe. This story is almost like the um, the year zero for mm. nearly every plot that's still running in it. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of nice that it's not one that people and writers and artists have to look back on and go, oh, it's a bit. Yeah. But this is what we're stuck with. I think yeah. people seem to quite like it. Well, you know, the the story literally seeds the idea of all thirteen. This very powerful energon variant that Shockwave has seeded various planets with and you know as recently as dark cybertron that all you know came back in a big way plot wise so you know it really was kind of you know i we did i don't think we intended to, it to be quite as grounding as it was no. it, you know but it did you know it still ripples on now this it's, it's a real, I mean, there's bits of it in scenes of the records as well there's a bit where tarantulas goes uh, back in time to find the ore that Shockwave seated and to improve on it basically to sort of because you know he's sort of surpassing his master and all that sort of stuff so yeah it's still like I said it's just a solid grounding and it's almost it doesn't make sense to ignore it it makes more sense to kind of use that and kind of uh, uh, but last year I met someone as a Transformers convention I met a kid uh, and his parent introduced him to me and said this is, uh, this is whatever his name was but his favorite comic is Spotlight Shockwave I'm like oh okay what age are you I'm eight he wasn't even born when this comic came out, and that was the moment I felt it for the first time. It was like, I'm not, I'm not new anymore! I've been doing this for ages! Yeah, so join, join the club. I know, I'm very much part of the club. But I think if I was eight years old, this would be one of my favourite comics. You know, it, it's, it's, got, it's got a bit of everything without having the need to have read nearly anything else that kind of goes alongside it. You know? And the spotlights were great for that because, you know, it. It's all very well writing these, 
you know, you tend to write for the trade now. You tend to write five or six part stories. And you don't have the same amount of standalone issue in those. But these were nice. You just had to tell a complete story. It had to be done in one, say a lot about the character, and then you're out of there. So uh, although we pushed the story back into the main story, they were always self-contained themselves. So we'll just quickly whip through the procedural side of it a little bit. This is just a page of my script, the Spotlight Shockwave. I've got the whole thing with me over there. But as you can see, I'm not overly verbose when it comes to panel descriptions. I definitely veer towards the John Wagner, who wrote Judge Dredd a lot, school of Dread on bike, Dread shoots gun, Dread, you know, scowls. I, you know, I really don't want to sort of be too prescriptive for the artist, so as much as possible it's just bang, 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 and then the artist can pick their angles, their long shots, their mid shots, their, their, their sort of main image on the page. And I'd rather not get too involved in that, because I trust the artist to be visually better than I am. So, you know, generally they're very loose. This is page seven, which we'll flip through in more detail, but I'm going to hand over to Nick now, because this is where Nick started playing around with the new idea of the Dinobots. Yeah, so it's Simon Scripter, who read the, the Shockwave Spotlight, and involves the Dinobots, who are spelled D-Y, the Dinobots, the D-Y-N-O-Bots. Um, kind of, uh, they're, they haven't taken dinosaur form yet, because there's no reason to do so. Um, they go to Earth, they've got a sort of... Um, where like bio disguises to kind of uh, protect them from like the energon uh, overload, just like Beast Wars. And um, because Simon mentioned in the script they gain the uh, Beast Modes a la Beast Wars, I was thinking the thing about Beast Wars is that none of the heads look like G1. They really went in kind of an unusual design direction. So it took me quite literally and decided to really like redesign like the Dinobots. Uh, so they go from looking very G1 in their sort of like Dreamwave War within big tank armor into going into this kind of like really quite odd sort of stylized look that's not a million miles away from some of the choices that were being made in the Beast Wars toys just previous to the era, to the year. But yeah, you can see that, uh, yeah, I've, I've, I've tried to sort of think about the characters and like their body language and even their proportions a little bit, you know, like Swoop obviously turns into a Pteranodon and there's not going to be the same physical mass in a Pteranodon as there would be in a, a T-Rex or a, or a, a Brachiosaurus or an Apatosaurus or whatever when the site sludges on the day. Um, so that's why, you know, and that, that gives you kind of a nice sort of visual uh, difference between the characters. Uh, some artists do tend to draw the Dinobots as the same physical shape for all five of them. And I just think it's, it helps me draw the one colour scheme as it is. If you can do anything to kind of uh, pick them out and make them look different, you can do it. So, uh, yeah, these are my character shots that I lovingly spent a very, very, very long time on because I was very much trying to impress my new boyfriend, Simon Fern. Uh, <laughs> but when you've been married 10 years, you stop doing this sort of stuff. So. Yeah, yeah, the, the magic has gone. The magic has gone, truly gone. Uh, so he doesn't do things like this anymore, probably. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just not send it to you. <laughs> it's a, no, I, I do, I, I, you know, I probably do more of this than I used to. I think I went through a phase where I, I did less of it, and now I just think it's more important to do it. And it's, it's basically kind of just, like really thumbnailing it and just really trying to nail uh, the look of your top page so you're kind of not like uh, you're not running into cul de sacs or blocks on the actual page itself you're doing everything you can to make sure that the story is readable I mean you can pick really kind of nice flashy pose or angle with limbs or like twisting it everywhere but if the figure isn't readable and the character isn't readable uh, you know you're not serving the story and that's your job so this is all about the shot choices and it's also in this instance because in the shot race spotlight there's some uh, mammoths because it's set in the, the dying days of the ice age um, I knew how to draw transformers I did not know how to draw, know how to draw woolly mammoths so I have to do a little bit of practice on that so I'm practicing my mammoths uh, here and I'm practicing sort of my angles and I'm figuring out the panel shapes for uh, for the page itself in the shockwave drawings here. And so yeah, this is the, the, my actual uh, thumbnails for the page. Uh, yeah. So yeah, so, see, you're, it's all about like, making choices. It's quite scribbly, but it's uh, it kind of you kind of see roughly the shapes of what everything's going to be. So you see those kind of odd blocks and panel one. Those are where the maps are going to be. Uh, then I just chose a sort of three panel sort of like, vertical panels to kind of tell the next part of the story. You can see here, 
that I wasn't quite happy with. Again, it's about making it readable and about getting the most information to the reader as possible. And I just thought this wasn't a strong enough image that it's going to be shockwave leaning down quite tightly enough. And so you can sort of see here, I decided to change it so it's got a shockwave to the right of the panel. You can still see the mammoths moving in the background. It's just a much more readable panel, it's a less confusing. Uh, and I did a change here as well where I have the mammoth. It was going to be uh, it's going to be less focus on the mammoth. It's going to be falling when you see shockwave in the background, but I decided to focus more so on just a single mammoth falling down. And I kind of uh, widened the borders on either side of it, uh, to my mind, just to make it a more isolated panel to kind of make you think, well, it's a, a lonely mammoth dying on a plane, uh, you know, pretty desolate stuff. And so it's kind of make you feel like, you know, you're drawing the meter's iris in on it. I kind of um, left a bit of dead space either side of it. So those are my choices to make my scribbly sort of uh, thumbnails. And then these are my finished pencils, pretty much, or as, as well as they scan. So you can see there that those blocks, they become those mammoths. Uh, you can see the change here I made by having shockwave on the right. There's like a mammoth passing by, so you're getting into the context of the two of them. And then you can see a more of a focus. And then you can use things like the mammoth's trunk then to sort of denote motion. You know, the trunk is trailing as he falls. It, uh, it really shows, you know, there's like a, a bit of an impact going on here. Uh, one of the other things that I, you are supposed to do, and you do do when you're uh, putting together a front page, is to try and remember to leave space for the lettering. It's really important. <laughs> and so many artists are quite bad at it. Uh, this is my first time out. I think I did okay. I definitely got better at it. But it's, um, that's, it's just one of those sort of hidden talents that like, you think, oh yeah, it's great. I can draw splashy images. I can draw very action-packed scenes. But you really need to plan the space that you're going to need to leave for the lettering into the composition of the rest of your image and page. Yeah, I mean, you know, what you don't want to do as an artist is do a wonderfully detailed background when you're pretty sure that I'm going to slap a big word balloon all over your lovely detail. So, you know, you make life easy for yourself as well, rather than filling the page. And, you know, my, my good friend Richard Starkings, who was, who was a letterer, always used to say to me, balloons float up. So I've always been a big advocate of having space above the characters for the speech balloons. The artist has also got to think of what order the characters are speaking in, so that you don't put the person speaking first on the right-hand side of the frame. You know, if Shockwave is, if, if the mouth is talking to Shockwave yeah. here, and, shock, and uh, the mouth, uh, sorry, Shockwave is speaking first, you want them the other way round. So you know, you've just got to think, you know framing your picture with the dialogue, which is why full script often helps in this. So, you know, we flick on to uh, Nick's inks to the page. Yeah, not much to be said, really. I mean, it is one of those pages where, if I look back, I think I do things differently, like maybe widening the, uh, the panel borders on. I don't know what I was thinking of then. I think it was being stingy with my paper or something. I don't know, but it's... Uh... But you can see as well with the inks, you, you do a lot of work, like, uh, with the depth. So you see there's like stronger outlines on the mammoth here than I used on Shockwave and the lighter outlines kind of pushes him further into the background. The, uh, the kind of the black turning sky is kind of like a nice graphic element as well. Uh, and it kind of like, yeah, it kind of gives a sense of like that they're sort of grounded too. And it's, it's pretty much that, it's just embellished after the, the pencils and thumbnails you've seen. So while all this is going on, while Nick's thinking and even while the colourist is colouring, you know, I go back to my script and I strip out all the panel description and leave only the dialogue and then I start to tinker with it because by now I've seen the pencil page and I'm thinking a bit more about do I need as much dialogue, do I need more dialogue, you know, or do I need less? And often I try and again pair back, you know, if the picture's telling the story it doesn't need too much in the way of words on it. So again, I often try and change my dialogue at this point, make it work with the page, you know, and then I'll do, this one hasn't got speech bubbles on it, but then I'll do a rough markup of where I want the speech bubbles or panels to go. And again, you can see I've utilised all that lovely dead space that Nick left me. Yeah, actually, the page we're using is an example. It doesn't have any speech balloons at all. It's all like internal monologues, so it's captioned. But, but yeah, the principle is the same about... It, 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 just, it just looks better to have the, the character's text, or any text at all, as above as the character as much as you can. I mean, it's okay to, you know, occasionally sort of trail a continuing conversation down the page, but you try and avoid it if you can. And, but you always make sure that it's at least starting up the top, do you know? 
And so this is the finished page as it, as it was published. And you can see everything now is in place. It was Josh's colours on this, wasn't That's it? That's right, yeah. It's the first time working interiors with Josh, but first time working interiors. So and he was my kind of go-to colourist from like the fan days or whatever. And uh, yeah, he's just done such a nice job. But it's when, it's when the lettering came through that I got really excited because it really sort of like I felt validated. It felt like this is an actual comic, you know? <laughs> and the one about the lettering just later examples in the issue where there's this special effects lettering. So it's big, big booms and crash and lots of thermonuclear detonations and it was like, I'm reading a comic, so I made it, but I'm still reading it. It's, yeah, it's great. So yeah, that was, I mean, that's one page, of course, out of 22. So you appreciate that on a monthly schedule, there's quite a lot of work going on, and this is why sometimes comics fall behind. And... It's also why, yeah, there's the, the, different uh, different workers can be doing different things at the same time, as you mentioned. That while I, you know, I thought the pencils that meant Simon could be thinking of the letters, and he could be passing on the lettering drafts, so or the letterer could be knowing where the placement's going to go. And, uh, the colorist is coloring pages while I'm letters. The letter is moving ahead while I'm penciling other pages. So, uh, yeah, it's 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 good. You can kind of keep all the plates spinning at once. So, this one is pretty much Nick to talk about. This is Spotlight Cup, which was his your first writer artist gig. Yeah, first and best. It's <laughs> and yet to be bettered. It's uh, yeah, it was my first time writing a, a comic. Uh, I got talking with Chris Royal about it. Like we were quite chatty on email for me doing artwork on the comics, and uh, so we knew that I had kind of a handle on um, the characters and, and the franchise and the universe in general. Um, and he mentioned that he was going to be like looking for a few new writers for a second series of Spotlights. And I initially stopped straight away. Oh, who do I know who can write it? And I started contacting friends of mine who I thought were good. One of them was James Roberts, who's since gone to do all right for himself, I guess. But but we, <laughs> but we had submitted. We had submitted stuff for him to um, to IDW back in 2006, and they just didn't. I guess they didn't have the relationship with him, and that was, I think, what got me the job more so than anything else. And so um, I, I remember going and having a shower and thinking, oh, I wonder if the guys will get a job working for the comics. I wonder what story they'll come up with. I wonder if I have a story. Oh, I have a story. And my story was was I had two stories. One was this. One was the um, if you read Sins of the Wreckers. The Roadbuster affair in Sins of the Wreckers is was actually going to be a spotlight with a Roadbuster spotlight, but uh, but this just seemed to make more sense as a standalone. So I kind of fleshed this out. It's basically I am Legend with Cup. And so when you're the writer artist, one of the best things about it is that you don't need to uh, you don't need to overwrite the panel directions. You don't need to overwrite uh, the descriptions about what's going into it. But it's my first time writing a comic, a fully fledged comic, and I just really it got the better of me in some ways. And I, I like so. Well, we're going to show you the making of one page of Cup, and it is a fairly involved page, but if you I'll, look... I'll, I'll flip through this, because yeah. it's quite long, isn't it's quite it? Long. So the second page, we're still on, this is still what, describing one page, we're on panel 9, panel 10, panel 11, up to panel 16 of the page, all that little bit of dialogue, all this description, Lawrence the panel at the bottom page now, and it's almost as if it's... And it's like, I know this, I'm going to be the one drawing it, but I guess I thought I needed to convince the editors that I knew what I was doing by showing them very clearly I didn't know what I was doing. Um, <laughs> There's a reason why this page was so involved, and to the point that I did quite a finished uh, set of thumbnails to convince them. I remember sending them the script and showing them this one page of thumbnails to go along with it. They say, hey, you know that page where I write 60 panels? Don't freak out, Chris. I've got this. And it's all about kind of the things you can do with comics and how you can sort of bend time and uh, really control how long the reader spends on a panel and kind of the, the, the pace that they read things at. So if you sort of see the kind of the first panel and then this, every sort of second panel after that, um, it's kind of little small insets of what's going to be Cup's shack, and it's going to be showing the passing of time. So you see the waning of the moon overnight. He's trapped in a shack with these zombies attack attacking him, and he's panicking and he's freaking out. And so we see, you know, the, the waxing and waning. I want to show like Cup freaking out. The zombies getting nearer, and the camera getting closer and closer on Cup's face as the cameras are getting closer and closer on the zombies as they get closer to him. And then this break of the tension as you sort of see here, the sunlight is starting to shine down on his house. There's more sunlight coming through, the sun starts coming into his uh, his room, it starts bouncing off and, and ultimately 
the sun is like left sort of shining on him, which means that the night is over, he survives another night. And so as you see, it was quite a detailed page. I wanted to show all those little bits of dialogue were to sort of help wrap up the tension, all that claustrophobic cup, 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 cup. Um, and so that's why in this instance I went kind of over the top, <coughs> describing what needed to be done and showing what needed to be done visually. And so this is the finished ink sonnet. And in some ways I prefer the, the, the kind of the rough one, but you can see it as well that just it's really, you know, if, we, if you just clip back and forth again, like it's, they, they really are overlaid quite nicely over each other, considering it's thumbnails. You know, everything is in its right place. Um, but then, yeah, so that's that's it. Inks. Uh, this, so this stage, I'm pen, I'm writing it and penciling it and inking it. I'm still still not any good at colouring it. Or uh, so this is the flats. The flats is when they just put in the basic colour values. Uh, there's no like, actual shading or uh, kind of rendering going on here, but it still looks really, really nice, I think. Uh, and then the next stage of the colouring is the, the rendering, and then the letters are out on here. So you can see that there's like a glow on the eyes, and there's a bit more kind of texture on like Cup's face, and then the scene in general than there was when it was just the flats. So that's the flats, and then you can see the big difference in the renders there. And then the lettering is on as well. I think it kind of helped that I've done that kind of sketch of where I envisioned all this huge amount of lettering going because it was, again, it was basically like, yes, okay, you have thought this page out well, and it, it probably, in this instance, helped the letter show him that I, I understood what I was doing and kind of give him an idea, oh, okay, I get you. So, that's it. I, I, I don't write as involved now, I still overwrite a lot. But uh, this is an example of an action scene that I wrote in Spotlight Megatron. Spotlight Megatron was a toy pack-in when they started doing toys based on the IDW figures. So, compared to my cup page, this is the panel description, a page description in the Megatron spotlight. There's like four panels on the page, and I think there's like six dialogue uh, selections. Yeah, so, so that's all there is. So that, it, it kind of shows in some ways, is he being lazier? No, I'm just being a better writer at this stage. I know how to, <laughs> it's a completely different scene. It's a big crash bang wallop scene, but it's, um, these are the pencils to it. So it's Megatron, and in this instance, it's got like a new body, so he turns into a, a stealth bomber. So there's the pencils as he's uh, chasing Starscream across an asteroid surface. Um, and it's just to kind of show you the difference, like the two scenes we've seen thus far with Shockwave and the, uh, the mammoths and Cup in his flat, they're, they're not very action-packed scene, but this is something you don't see that often in comics, which is a, a vehicular battle. So like, you don't see many car chases, you don't see many dog fights. And so it's, it's again, trying to make it readable, you know, it's like the, the two jets flying across the plane and Starscream traveling back around. And, it's, uh, the two strafing each other as they go by, but you see more and more what the what elements are added as the inks go on. So you can certainly see there's like a plain background here in the last uh, last image. Uh, it's still plain when it comes to this inks. This is the, the ink starts is much sharper. Uh, you can sort of see like the way your eye is kind of guided up here, and then your eye kind of follows down here, and then to the, the next scene. It's a uh, added speed lines into the last panel. Then I think before it goes to colours. And I would have done that digitally rather than have like take a headache of sort of just doing it hand by hand and sort of overlapping and having to sort of white out bits. Uh, I just used like a digital uh, kind of like template to do the speed lines on the next one. Because one of the most important things with laying out a comic page is getting the flow of the, of the story right on the page. So you don't want the eye to have to not know where to go. You know, the eye naturally moves across and then down and across and then down and across. And what you don't want to do is confuse that because immediately you do that, you sort of break the spell. Yeah. You, you take the reader out of the story because they've got to think, where do I go next? So part of laying out a page is very much, you know, keeping that flow of story across and down the page until you've done. Like even the fact that Starscream is traveling from left to right and that's roughly the way he's moving there. You know, like, it, if that image was flipped, it would have kind of stopped the flow of, uh, of the action. So you sort of see there, just drop in the speed lines, and uh, then it's ready to go to the colorist. Len O'Grady was the colorist on this one. And there's a really, really nice job of it. And then I chose a nice kind of like, you know, it's in space with like a brown asteroid, but he chose, he chose like a nice colorful background to sort of kind of heighten the drama in the last panel. And then it's uh, letters after that. Yeah. I think the letter's gonna help, like the lettering here is gonna help leading across the panel, you know, so it's a, it's all, all a job well done. But again, it's, a, it's to show you a different way again of like how even the same writer and the same artist can work on a project a few years apart, but uh, approach it in a different way and, and not kind of, you know, over overwrite it. Crazy, I just knocked a contact lens out. <laughs> okay, so moving on, 
uh, that, I mean, this is very much just the process. As you can see, it's a very labour-intensive process, getting 22 pages of comic strip together. But um, now we're going to step outside that and just look at a little bit of Transformers comics history. Um, you know, that's just there to fill a space at the moment, but I'm going to take you into a little bit of a gallery now of some of the art that maybe you haven't seen from, you know, the bridge between Dreamwave and IDW. Now, I'm, I don't know about how many of you know, but Dreamwave held the license for Transformers comics between 2002 and 2004, and then they kind of crashed and burned a bit, unexpectedly, uh, and a lot of things didn't really get finished off. There was a Generation 1 comic in progress, there was Transformers Energon, there was um, a War Within, Age of Wrath, and there was a Beast Wars comic that never saw print. So the first one I'm going to show you is uh, Don Figueroa's cover to um, Beast Wars issue one, as would have been. Uh, and with the, the, the slight difference between the Dreamwave Beast Wars and what became the IDW Beast Wars, is that this was going to be very much a continuation of the TV show. We were going to find a way to drag them back to Earth as they leave at the end of episode, you know, the final episode of season three, and actually bring the core cast back to Earth, which is something we scrapped for the uh, IDW version. So, here's a bit more of uh, Don's interior pencils, which features the crash nemesis spacecraft and Magnetron, who was our uh, featured villain for the series and who then got migrated to the IDW version of the story. And as you can see, this is the Autobot Shuttle craft with Megatron sort of stuck to the hull, outer hull, heading out at the very end as we leave it at season three, the end of season three. Uh, just a few more of the pencils. As you can see, we go into the shuttle craft and we see Optimus Primal and the crew. And, uh, you know, very much it was a, a, a sort of a catch-up and we then go into a flashback from the, from the end of season three, which shows the sort of final events from uh, Nemesis part two. And then we go into a strange dream sequence in which Rat Trap starts to sort of imagine he's meeting some of these other Beast Wars characters that never made it into the show. This is uh, Optimus Minor, I believe. And he meets uh, a few other big, there's the big, you know, the names are going to escape me, but there's the wolf and the buffalo character. Bone Crabby, yes. Wolfang, that's right, and, uh, thank you. Uh, you know, and, and he goes into a strange dream sequence, which is going to be a part of a warning that there's something wrong on their, their sort of journey through time on the way home. But he's roundly disbelieved. There's Megatron stuck to the outer hull. And as you can see, he's sort of breaking free at this point because there's some massive sort of disruption in the time stream by dint of the fact that they're heading home. There's a scene from Through the Issue, lovely Don shot of Optimus Primal. His pencils are so, so tight as well, aren't they? They're, they're amazingly, amazingly detailed. Yeah. And there's Megatron 3 on the final splash page of the issue in his dragon form, which I always loved. I really thought it was a, a very cool log mode. Uh, and that was how issue one would have finished. Uh, issue two was never drawn, but that's the cover to issue two, which flashed back to Megatron's trial, you know, which was again part of the show mythos. You know, we very much wanted to embed it in what uh, Larry and Bob had done on the show, and, and yeah, that was part of it. So let's flip from Beast Wars to Energon. Now, Energon issue 31 came so close to coming out. It was printed, 
it was at the, it was, uh, you know, it was, it, it, it was packed up, ready to go, and so somewhere, I guess they must have pulled them, uh, Imogen 31 did exist, but never came out. I'm just going to flip for a few of these. This is Alex Milne, is it? This is Alex Milne, yes. And you know, Alex and I and Imogen, we were having a great time. It was almost like nobody worried about what we were doing on Imogen. And we were just having this, telling this great story, and it was all setting up to move into Transformers Cybertron at issue 36. So we were, we were gung-ho to go on this, and Alex was really kind of finding his sort of artistic, you know, sort of, of I don't know, sort of chutzpah. He was just going for it, and, you know, we, we were just having such a blast at this. I really, really love Transformers. I know that seems like an obvious thing to say, but it's... I don't think it is that obvious. Not every artist loves the comic they work on, but he's he really he really feels like if he's on a comic, it's his comic, you know. And, and yeah, he would have put his heart and soul into this. Yeah, so I'll flick through a few more of these, more of Alex's work. You know, we were enjoying. We had the Four Horsemen of Unicron that uh, we'd introduced into the series. Alpha Quintesson was a big character in it. This is um, the cover for Thirty uh, Two. Uh, oh no, sorry, it's a splash page for 32, which had, um, you know, uh, the wheel, that's Wheeljack, I believe, Energy on Wheeljack, and, you know, again, we were just sort of, you know, you know, there's, there's the Four Horsemen at the end of 32, so much of this was written and drawn, you know, at least three issues were written, you know, a couple were drawn, very disappointing that we never got to do that. So, then we move on to Age of Wrath, which was the, the War Within series that was half done at the time. These are some of um, Pat Lee's designs for a couple of characters that were never used. Uh, I don't know, I thought these were Pat's. Maybe they're not. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Just, they didn't, they didn't. Joe Eaton was the artist yeah, of the it's series. Yeah, more Joe Eaton to me. To, yeah. um, I think. Unless they were based off of Pat's originals, yeah, but, was, you know, yeah. I mean, but well, these were a couple of, what, Atomic Pile was one, and uh, Critical Mass was the other, and these were meant to be new characters created by Grimlock Spark, which, because he dies at the beginning of Age of Wrath, apparently, and uh, these, these two new characters were supposed to be half of him, half of his spark each, put into new bodies by Shockwave. But that, that, that story angle actually got dropped from it, uh, and you know, we went a different direction. These are some of Joe Ian's pencils for issue four. And again, issue four was quite a, a, a way along, because you know, we had colours and letters pages for Age of Wrath, which... Uh, Sadly, again, never saw print. You know, and this was Quintessa. We were very much on the home world of the Quintessons at this point. The pencils are hard to see on this, I realise, but these are some of Joe's pencils for the same issue. Again, inked and coloured versions. This was a magnificent double page spread which shows their passage down through Cybertron. So it's almost like it starts up there, and then you follow them down deeper and deeper into Cybertron, which we were, you know, which I, I, I thought, well, this sounds great on the script page. Poor artist, really, but, you know, he did a really great job with that. So, you know, that was some of the, sadly, some of the the, the Dreamwave stuff that never saw print, but then, in very short order, IDW picked up the license, and suddenly we were doing, we, you know, I was partnered with EJ Sue to do some nice character redesigns. There's Bumblebee's updated uh, sort of sketch mode, sketch robot mode, and Megatron. And as you can see, we were looking very much at you know, making them work with the actual, you know, sort of updated, whether it's the updated uh, uh, F-16s, I think we went for, for the uh, Seekers, and the updated Walther for Megatron. So, you know, uh, 
you know, EJ was a very technical artist, and I think he really relished this idea of, of literally breaking down the components and working out how that would work with Megatron's transformation. He's, he's got an engineering background, I think, EJ, doesn't he? And he's yeah. probably done some engineering design work, but it's just on show, it's amazing. So those were some of the early designs. There's our first design for Verity, who of course has gone on to become a major part of the IDW-verse. Yeah, she died in Sins of the Records, but it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, she'll be back. <laughs> I'll just flip through a few other bits. There's Andrew Wildman's uh, Pencils and Inks for the wraparound for Infiltration 1. Here's some of Don's Stormbringer redesigns, says Bludgeon. So, you know, for a second time, we had to do, Don, poor old Don, had to do this idea of retrofitting, which he'd already done it for War Within, retrofitting 50 characters, how they look on Cybertron. With IDW Stormbringer, he had to do the same thing again, because we suddenly had characters who didn't have Earth Alt modes yet, so he had to rethink Bludgeon, you know, before he ever was a pretender. So, you know, he kept elements of the skull in his original robot mode. There's the design for Thunderwing. You know, and the outer sort of shell mode as well, which, uh, you know, just gave him one more headache to figure out. I always have the impression Don enjoyed it though, I think. Well, I don't know if that's true or not, but Don, he just took to this stuff so well that I just assumed he was enjoying, like, redesigning it to the extent that he was doing it, you know? Yeah. So that really brings us to the end of, you know, our little sort of show, show and tell, as it were. But if anybody's got any questions, we've got a few minutes before we wrap up. If anyone's got any burning questions they want to ask. about Transformers. Uh, you know, I, I would say I'm not the target audience, very politically. I, 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 no, I really like the first one. I thought it had plenty of wow factor and, you know, I, I, I enjoyed it. But, I, I, you know, I've struggled with the one since. But, you know, you just can't argue with the kind of box office that they do and the general effect it's had on Transformers as a whole. You know, I think the movies and the success of the movies has propped up the whole of the Transformers brand and, and given it sort of impetus and stability that has kept everything else, you know, flourishing as well. So as much as I don't particularly, you know, love them, I think they have really helped the Transformers brand as a whole. It, it's, yeah, so unusual. Like, it, a lot of the conventions that we... It is still there, Simon. Yeah, it's, it's got it. Yeah, got it. <laughs> uh, a lot of the conventions you go to uh, now, there's uh, like a, almost like a 50-50 split between uh, female Transformer fans and male Transformer fans, and you talk to these female Transformer fans who are maybe about 20, and you're sort of like, what, what, how did you get into Transformers? And they're like, oh yeah, the Michael Bay film. And it's so weird because it, they're not... The Michael Bay Transformers films are not very girl-friendly, I find. Not very girl... <laughs> Empathetic or sympathetic, you know, it's um, yeah, they're they're the, I think the first one's a really good Transformers film. It's, it's and it's a flip film that you can sort of show to someone saying, Hey, do you want to know about Transformers? Here's a good introduction to it. The only film, one of them I didn't struggle with was uh, Age of Extinction, but that's because I just didn't bother seeing it. So, <laughs> <laughs> any other questions? Uh, okay, a question for both of you. Uh, was there ever any Transformers characters that you wanted to redesign? Uh, I mean, the personality or the voice or whatever, but were not able to because of uh, Castro or uh, the overarching uh, storyline or whatever. But personally, I don't think I've, I've ever got to that stage where there was something I wanted to do and didn't. I mean, there, there, I'm sure there are characters I would love to have got to in spotlights and whatever else, but. I don't think, I mean, Hasbro have always, you know, in my experience, been really, really accommodating. I don't think I've, especially, certainly in the IDW time, I've had no run-ins or, 
you know, blocks from Hasbro on, on anything, really. They've always been really kind of supportive of what we're doing and what we want to do on this. And so, no, I don't think I've ever had a kind of situation where it's like, I want to do this and somebody's told me I can't. Yeah. Um, I, my answer would probably be Thunderclash. I really like Thunderclash from like the late G1 kind of European stuff. Uh, and I would love to be the one to get to do something with him. Uh, I really like what James and Alex have done with him about being this super smug superhero that uh, thinks he's great. And I think that's a call to his tech specs, whether it was just 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, you know, and it's, it's a good way of taking a dig at that. But I, I love that sort of era of Transformers, so I, I kind of. I had, I had my cake and ate it with like we got to do the Predators in Last Down of the Wreckers and we you know we got to do like Rotor Storm and we've had like Iron Fist and Pyro and so it's I kind of would like to have completed the set almost by getting to do uh, uh, something with Thunderclash but otherwise no not really I, I have I have an idea that I really want to do for uh, Punch Counter Punch and it's not because I have a huge love for the character but I've just got an idea that would work. And I want to make sure that I'm the one to do it, but uh, I don't know if it's going to happen. I, I know IDW had a punch counter punch story that they had bought from someone. They had actually commissioned someone to write a series about punch counter punch, and it never got made. But the series was written like seven years ago, and it was supposed to fit in with the continuity seven years ago. So it's not going to get put out now because it's not going to fit. So I think they're just writing it off as a loss. But I hope that means that that means another punch counter punch idea. Because, but then. You know, I don't know if a punch counter punch series is what's going to sort of, you know, overshadow, uh, you know, Final Crisis and uh, you know, whatever's going on Final Crisis like ten years ago. <laughs> well, yeah, the New Fifty Two Rebirth. Well, whatever DC you're doing these days. Uh, but no, otherwise I think I've been pretty lucky. I've got to design Hot Rod. I got to design Springer. I got to design Cup. I guess I would like to design Blur and RC just to sort of complete the set, but I got to do Magnus, so I'm kind of, uh, yeah, there's no, no complaints, I don't think. It's just Thunder Clash would be good. <laughs> One more question, and then we'll wrap up. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know. Well, you know, I, I don't think I ever decide I have to kill someone. I mean, I think when you're dealing with a war, you know, there are going to be casualties. And, you know, I don't want to shy away from doing that, but neither do I want to do it just gratuitously. Mm. You know, when, say, we were doing the Marvel comic and we had the big Unicron battle, it just felt entirely unrealistic that they all walk away from it unscathed just because they're named characters. So I think I just want, I always want to show there's a kind of cost to this. There's a real price to this. I, I sort of hate movies where people are bounced off roofs and fall through windows and, and, you know, and they pick themselves up like they're made of rubber, you know. I, I kind of want people to understand that there are consequences, that, you know, it's not a great game, all this. And, and I always feel that there should be, you know, there should, characters should go in this. So, I don't, you know, I, I try to do it, you know, to have impact. It's an either to have impact because it's so sudden and so almost meaningless. Or that, like the Scorponok death in, in 75, it's more that he dies, there's, there's been a big character arc build up to this moment of will he stand up and be counted, that when he does and dies, and you know, it's a real kind of moment with him and Optimus, that he, he, you know, he did it, he stood up, he became more than the sum of his Decepticon evil parts, as it were. So they either have weight, or they're so like, oh my god, you know, somebody just died. Senseless. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah, yeah people, you don't, you don't choose to kill a character based on how much you like or dislike them, really. It's, it's kind of, it has to serve the story, I find, really. So, uh, but then if you put together like a, a roster like the Wreckers, you, you know, again, similar, you know, they're not all going to make it out alive, so you figure out whose story can have a beginning, middle, and end, and, and who, need, who needs to live past the story, I guess. Maybe in some instances, like, you know, there needed to be, yeah, Rotorstorm needed to die, you know, like, he was always going to be the first to die in Wreckers, but I, you know, he's still a good character, we still have a backstory for him, but uh, had to be someone, and, and the other characters just had stories that needed to require them to stay alive for a few more issues, or even beyond the five issues, so it's, it's never done, it's never done for shock value or for ratings. <laughs> uh, really, I mean, if, if it comes, that's great. But it's never you're never thinking, oh, they're gonna they're gonna love this on Tumblr, you know. So yeah. Okay. 
Well, look, thank you all very much for uh, listening and uh, watching, and uh, and please enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I'm around it. <laughs> <laughs>